This is the lesson for European history for Tuesday, the 15th of March, 2022. Everyone should have their note tags out like almost every other day. <laughs> yes, so still, people don't. All. Um, last time and the time before we were together, we talked about Impressionism and Post-Impressionism and uh, dealt with the introduction of human beings and their interpretive ability uh, between the viewer of the art, uh, or should I say between the objective world that the artist is perceiving and the uh, work of art that they are producing. And there's truth in this. Alan Bean was an astronaut on the second Apollo moon mission that landed on the moon. He is the astronaut personally responsible for frying the color television camera by accidentally taking the lens cap off when it was aimed at the sun while he was setting the camera up. And it fried the camera, and so there were no video pictures from the second moon mission. Maybe in recompense for this, or just because he was moved to, astronaut Bean... Uh, did a series of paintings about his recollections of what the moon was like. Now, human beings have sent probes to pretty much everywhere in the solar system. We've sent probes to comets, asteroids. Uh, we have two probes that have left the solar system, Voyagers 1 and 2. And despite all of that, the only places we've been are the Earth, the orbital space around the Earth, and Luna. Because that's the only place human beings have walked and come back to tell other human beings what it was like. Sending our artifacts is not the same thing as sending ourselves. Sending a probe does not convey the same experience as sending people. We will not be to Mars until we send expeditions there, nor will we ever go to the asteroid belt or the moons of Jupiter or Saturn or the other gas giants or into Mercury. I think we will avoid Venus like the plague planet it is. Um, but only when human beings do it will it matter. And to solve the various problems of spaceflight beyond the short relatively short voyages from the Earth to the Moon, will require us to develop a bunch of technologies that we don't have. A human being must explain the reality of their experience, of their witness, to other human beings. This is why it was so important to interview and talk with and interact with and record the testimony of survivors of genocide like the Holocaust. Because it is so easy for historians to ignore and for people to forget the reality of what happens. And um, the historical philosopher Santayana was not wrong when he said that those who forget history are doomed to repeat it witness the nonsense that's going on in the world right now. And uh, like every other set of man-made problems, it's entirely preventable. This entire thing was entirely preventable. But we did not choose wise leaders, and they did not do wise things, and we did not take the opportunities to prevent things from getting more out of hand. We still have opportunities to prevent things from getting more out of hand than they are right now. Obviously, we'll disagree about the details, but the point of Impressionism and Post-Impressionism is it takes a person to explain to another person reality. Statistics won't cut it. This is why in courts of law, we argue verbally. You don't just give a jury a bunch of paperwork. <clears throat> the prosecutor argues why the accused is guilty of these specific crimes with this evidence. The defense attorney argues why there is a reasonable doubt that this person committed these crimes based on the paucity of the evidence. This is verbal. 
This is why rhetoric is still important. This is why people who take debate are uh, preparing themselves for uh, to, to develop the necessary skills of politicians and lawyers because we speak to one another. We listen. We are persuasive or we are not. That is what the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists insist upon. Their humanity as much as anything else, is a necessary component in taking that field of wheat and turning it into something magnificent, transcendent. So having said that, let's look at, can you shut the right light switch on? Let's look at and listen to some uh, things in the world of music. The world of music is transitioning from Romantic era music, Wagner, Mahler, so forth, towards neoclassical music, which is definitely the music of the 20th century, the early and mid 20th century anyway, the music of dissonance, of atonality, uh, music that is not popular in, in the same ways, music that can cause problems. So, we're going to do is I'm going to play a little bit of music in this transitional phase from Romantic era music to um, neoclassical. And I'll probably pause it so that YouTube doesn't think that I'm being naughty. Um, Gustav Holst famously wrote a series of tone poems, not quite symphonies, but focused tone poems on uh, the planets. Holst's The Planets, um, prefigures the kind of horrific mechanized warfare that comes in World War One, and I guess I'll pause it and we'll play it. Do, 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 do. Admittedly, the Disney footage for uh, the Rites of Spring was sad. I remember seeing the film in the theater. I think it was the first movie I ever saw. And I cried when the dinosaurs died. Oh, sad. It, it is. But um, what you're seeing is 1940s era science, which is another reason I chose to show that. Um, they did not believe in plate tectonics or continental drift. They believed in the continents rising and falling like Atlantis. So you saw a little bit of that. The destruction of the dinosaurs wasn't due to an asteroid, it was due to drought, climate change, uh, global climate change that destroyed the dinosaurs' ability to eat by destroying the, the plants that they depended upon. But I hope you caught the difference between that and the music that we've been listening to before this, which is its dissonance. It's atonality. It's difficulties with... Well, it's not difficulties. It's refusal to follow... It's refusal to follow... Is she okay? She's fine. I don't think it fell on her. No, it didn't. Did she scare her? Thanks. Yeah. me too. <laughs> Gravity. Gravity's a scary thing. In any event, understand that the classical norms that we have been experiencing are being called into question. The very uh, euphony of music, its beauty, and its willingness and interest in reaching out to popular culture. There was not the great distinction between popular culture and high culture in this period. But the distinction began when music goes off into that kind of unpleasant soundingness 
fewer people are willing to patronize it, to care about it, to be involved in it. And so the difference between folk music, which is the music that everyday people make and listen to, and high culture, which is symphonic music and operas and music that pushes the boundaries of music theory, becomes wider and wider and wider. And the same thing is going to be true in art. So, any questions, comments, or thoughts about uh, the whole Stravinsky as we are moving towards Weber and then neoclassicism? Yeah. Have you ever heard Stravinsky's Firebird? Yeah, I like it. I like Stravinsky. Uh, Str uh, Stravinsky, I do. And I also like the fact that he was an anti-communist Russian. <laughs> that meant something to me. Uh, do you like it? I assume you do if you are yeah. mentioning it. I, I like it. It's one of my favorite things. Yeah. I prefer the Rites of Spring myself, but yeah, no, I, I have Firebird. I like the Rites right of Spring. is just kind of chaos. Indeed. If you can't imagine why anyone would start a riot over that, let me, by analogy, okay, you go to a church ice cream social and you're expecting religious music and you end up hearing death metal, heavy metal, yeah. Satan woo, stuff <laughs> instead. And it's not what you expected, and it's not what you wanted. Um, that's there, there was there was that separation. Okay, so uh, tomorrow, which is Wednesday, we will do the walk up to World War One. My expectation is that it will be able to be done in one day because it's summary. Um, did Mr. Johnson talk with you about that? I, I offered him the opportunity to talk about the beginning of World War One. Did he? He kind of went off about Ukraine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he has opinions on Ukraine. He does. Yeah. They're yeah. different from mine, but uh, he he certainly you know has his reasons and his points. And again, it's it's good for you to hear all sorts of people. Um, no, and actually, he is not one of the people that I about uh, I, about the guest speaker I brought in. I did not expect her to say those things, but I did, uh, and I have talked to Mr. Johnson about Ukraine. We we respectfully agree to disagree uh, about it, but that's fine. Okay, so he didn't talk about this. Fine, we'll talk about it tomorrow. I would expect you to have your exam on Thursday, and uh, after the exam, we're going to go into World War One. And I expect to cover most of the war before vacation. Uh, to those droves of you who are going to be gone for part of next week, you are responsible for seeing the videos of what you miss and for doing anything that we are doing and for being ready when we come back. Any questions? Then thank you.